This morning's scripture reading comes from Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 2, verses 40 through 47. Acts chapter 2, verses 40 through 47, which reads, And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. In those, then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among divided and, and divided them among all as any had need so continually daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Good morning. Good to see everybody today. I joined with Brother Jeff who led the singing. I think he's dead on. It's a beautiful day. Sky may be dreary and there may be bad things going on in the world, but it is the Lord's day and we are gathered with the Lord's people to worship the Lord, and that always is a good day. It's always a good day to be alive on God's earth, regardless of what day of the week it is. To be alive on His earth, to serve Him, and to glorify Him in whatever ways that we can in our own personal lives. So that is a good thing. Uh, if you are visiting with us, and we always have visitors every week, and today is no exception, we are so grateful for your presence, and we invite you to come back with us anytime you have opportunity. We will meet tonight at 5 o'clock. And uh, we'll have another worship service. Normally on Sunday nights we have Bible classes, but this being the first Sunday of the month, we'll have another worship service very much like this morning. And then Wednesday nights we meet at 7, uh, usually having Bible classes for all ages, but I believe this Wednesday will be our singing night. So we would love to have you come any or all of those opportunities of service. And while we're thinking about that, uh, I'll just remind you that our meeting is coming up in two weeks. Two weeks from today our gospel meeting will be starting. And I want to give a reminder to our members about the importance of being present and participating in the meeting. And I want to give an invitation to our visitors. If you're visiting with us in two weeks, we'll be starting a gospel meeting. I won't be in the pulpit, but a brother named Don Truex, very well-known gospel preacher, will be standing here and will be preaching the gospel. You will not be disappointed uh, to come and hear Brother Truex. He's an outstanding speaker, outstanding preacher of the gospel. And we invite you, our visitors, as well to come uh, and to worship with us during that week. It will go from Monday until Wednesday. Uh, we'll be meeting each night through the week at 7 o'clock, our regular times on Sunday, and each night through the week at 7 o'clock until Wednesday. Uh, and please come and be with us. The text that was read in Acts chapter 2 by Brother Chris, verses 40 to 47, really deals with what we sometimes call the birthday of the Church of Christ. This was the day that the church came into existence. And actually, to be more specific, starting with about verse 42, not just the birthday, but the days following. Uh, because he talks about continuing steadfastly and day by day. So from Acts 2, 40, uh, 42 and on, really deals with not just Pentecost Day, but Pentecost and the days that followed. But I could call that, uh, I think with, without successful contradiction, I could call that the, the first gospel meeting of the New Covenant era. Uh, they didn't call it a gospel meeting back then, but they're doing exactly what we will be doing. They're meeting and they're worshiping and they're serving the Lord and preaching the gospel. That's what we'll be doing in our gospel meeting. So we could actually call this the first gospel meeting under the New Covenant. And I just wanted to talk with you, just give you a few reasons, and we could probably add to the list. I think I've got six or seven here, but we could probably add to the list of reasons, but six or seven reasons why we should be at this meeting. Uh, I do this just to remind us, I think we know, I think we know these things, there's nothing new here, 
but just to remind us and to perhaps motivate us to be here and to want to be here for this gospel meeting. So let's think about that for a little while this morning. First reason that we need to be here to attend this gospel meeting, my brethren, is because we're part of a bigger picture. Take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul is discussing the body of Christ, the church, the universal body, actually, and I think we sometimes lose sight of that. We think uh, he's writing about the local church in 1 Corinthians 12, and he is actually not. Uh, in verse 13, he says, for example, by one spirit, were we all baptized into one body? The one body always refers to the universal church. And you're not baptized into a local church. You're baptized into the universal church. You join a local church, Acts 9, verse 26. And so it is clear here that he's talking about the universal family of God. And he's comparing it to the human body, using an illustration. And dropping down here just to get a piece of that in verses 20 through 22. He says, but now indeed there are many members yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Now, there's a lot of things that could be said about those verses, but the, the main point I want you to see is that as a member of the body of Christ, as a member of the family of God, the church in its universal sense, you are part of a bigger picture. Your contribution is needed. Every person in the body of Christ is necessary. We might think, notice that very carefully there in verse 22, we might think that they're not necessary, but they are. Every Christian is needed in the body of Christ. And you can show that uh, participation by being present in our meeting. But you're also, not only are you part of the universal family, but you're part of this local family as a member here at Fishers. Flip on out here with me to the 14th chapter. And in chapter 14, he's actually talking about the local church coming together and some of the things that happened back in those days in their assemblies. Uh, I urge you, by the way, on your own time to study 1 Corinthians 14. It's one of the few detailed glimpses we get into the assemblies of the first century church. And there's a lot to learn in these verses. But verse 26 in particular, he says, How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together? So here now the local church at Corinth assembling together. Whenever you come together, each one of you, has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. I, I focus your attention here on the, on the phrase, each one of you or each of you. Think about that. This is the idea of being part of a bigger picture. You're part of the bigger picture in the universal family, and you're part of the bigger picture in the local family. Every local church depends upon every member. There are elders, and there are deacons, and there are, there are preachers, and there are saints, and there are Bible class teachers, and we've all got a role to play. And that's why I called your attention to that phrase, each one of you. They all wanted to participate in some way. Now, we know that participation for some is limited. We understand that. Talents for some are limited. But everybody wanted to be involved. Everybody wanted to be there. And everybody wanted to participate in some way, shape, form, or fashion. So you're part of a bigger picture. And being a Christian, uh, we need to be reminded that a bigger picture is not just you. You know, many years ago, uh, some of you older folks may remember this. Some of you younger folks will not know what I'm talking about. But there used to be a singer on the radio. His name was Tom T. Hall. And he had this song. Uh, that it was very popular at the time. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. Well, what, I, what the sad news is, that's kind of nearsighted. It's not just me and Jesus. It's me and Jesus and my brethren. It's me and Jesus and the church. It's me and Jesus and the bigger picture. And we need to be able to see that bigger picture. And being a Christian involves, yes, personal and individual obligations, but also collective obligations. Flip on out here to the 16th chapter. Just a few moments ago, we took up a collection. The men were standing at this table, and they passed the collection plates around, and we took up a collection, and, and the authority for that comes from these verses. And notice there's, there's a couple of aspects here. He says, concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. Notice, first of all, the order was to the churches. These were congregations, so you have the collective. But then notice also that each individual has a part in that. Let each one of you, verse 2, each one of us individually contributes something to the collective treasury. 
And so there are individual obligations and there are collective obligations. And in these collective obligations, such as this meeting that's coming up in two weeks, we show ourselves to be part of a bigger picture. That's why you need to be here. Don't forget about your brethren. It's not just you and Jesus. It's you and Jesus and your brethren. It's you and Jesus and the local congregation. Don't forget about that, and you're part of that bigger picture. So I encourage you to please be here for that very reason. These are good biblical reasons to, to make your attendance every time we meet during that meeting. Here's another reason. You had plenty of notice, including today. That's why I started this two weeks early. Including today, you've had plenty of notice. Everybody knows if you if you visited here very much, or if you remember here especially, you know this. We come in before services ever start. There there are slides pat, circul, cir, circulating through here on the screen before services, and one of those slides will have a, a listing of all of our gospel meetings. And if you've stopped and read that, hopefully that hopefully you have, because that's why that's put up there. So you will stop and read it. You will notice that we have gospel meetings planned out years in advance. We know who's coming. And we know when they're coming. We know the dates. We know it's springtime. We do it twice a year. We've done this for years. This, ch this church has been meeting for years. This is not a surprise. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes brethren will come up to me when a meeting's come up. They act like they got caught off guard. Oh, I didn't know the meeting's come. I I I'm not going to be here. I didn't know we was going to have a meeting. Excuse me. How could you not know? How could you not know we're going to have a meeting? It's been up here every week, week after week. And we've done it for years. That's, to, to act like you're surprised and the meeting caught you off guard, give me a break. That's, that's, that's not going to work. With few exceptions, we can make arrangements for this. I know things happen. I understand that. I've had things happen to me. And you can't come for one reason or another. I've had things happen to me. But for the most part, we can plan our lives, especially when you know years in advance when these meetings are coming, we can make arrangements to our personal schedules so that we can be here. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can do that. You do what you want to do. And most of the time, uh, if you want to be here, you can make those arrangements. And so what I'm saying to you is when we have members who do this on a regular basis, that is to say they've always got that excuse, well, caught me off guard and I can't come. Now that might happen once, but when it happens meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting, that's just poor planning. Poor planning on your part. You're not participating in that bigger picture aspect of me and Christ and my brethren. You're not seeing the bigger picture and you're just making poor plans and poor decisions. So I encourage you once again, you've had plenty of notice. There's no reason for you to say, I didn't know. So be here at our meeting. You're part of this work, and you should support it. But here's another reason, and that is you can invite all of your contacts. Have you ever thought of how easy it is to invite people to services now? Have you ever thought about that? It is easy as pie to invite. It used to be years ago, and, and, and brethren would dread it, you know. Brethren, they would dread. Well, we're going to all get a bunch. We're going to meet at the building. We're all going to get a pile of gospel meeting announcements. We're just going to run around the neighborhood and knock on doors, and everybody dreaded it. Nobody wanted to do that. Well, you don't have to do that anymore. You, don't have, you, can, you, can, you can send a text out just like that, a text message. Please come to our meeting this time, this place, uh, these dates. And it doesn't take very long to type that up. You can send it out as a text message. You can send it out as a mass text. You can do it by email. You can do it by telephone. There's all sorts of ways that you can invite people. We even will send you an electronic copy. We do send you. We, we, you don't even have to ask for it. We do send you an electronic copy of our meeting announcements. You just forward that to somebody else or a whole bunch of somebody else. So you can invite all kinds of people to the meeting. And, of course, if you do that, you certainly want to be here if they happen to show up, don't you? It'd be, wouldn't that be something? You invite them to come, and they come, and then you're not here, and they're looking for you. Well, where's my buddy? Where's the one who invited me? And he's not here. So you want to be here for that as well. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 22. And, of course, what we have here is the Great Supper. And there was an invitation sent out, a marriage supper. Let's start here in verse 1. Jesus answered and spoke to them again by a parable. He said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king, of course that would be Jesus, who arranged, or that would be the father, I'm sorry, who arranged a marriage for his son. His son would be Jesus. Arranged his marriage and he sent out his servants. That would be us. <laughs> that would be us. He sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. And they were not willing to come. Look at that. 
we run into that, don't we? We run into people. We invite people, and there are people that we invite who aren't willing to come. That, that does happen. In fact, I would imagine that most of the people you invite aren't going to come. It always works out that way. Most of the people that you invite aren't going to come, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't invite them. The Lord wants you to invite them. Drop down here with me to verses 9 and 10. He says, Go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So the servants went out in the highways and gathered all together whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. Now this wedding feast he's talking about, I don't think it's going to take place really in its fullness till the end of time. I got that. I understand the context here. But if you're going to make that final wedding feast, somebody's going to have to invite you to hear the gospel, aren't they? They're going to have to invite you to come around where the gospel is being preached and invite you to hear the gospel so you have a chance to know where you stand and know what to do to be saved. Otherwise, you're never going to be invited to that final feast. And so we're doing the inviting all of the time. Please come. Please come here. Please come and listen to the gospel so that you can obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nobody is going to be in that ultimate feast, finally, the ultimate feast in heaven. Nobody's going to be there who wasn't first invited by the king. That, that's an interesting uh, thought, isn't it? Let's back up here. We were looking earlier at uh, verses 2 and 3. He says, he sent out, verse 3, sent out servants to call those who were invited, and they were not willing to come. And again, he sent out other servants, saying, tell those who were invited, see, I prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle are killed, all things are ready, come to the wedding. But they made light of it, that's what most people do. They made light of it, and they went their way, one to his farm, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. That would be the persecution of early Christians in particular. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. And he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Now go out and find as many as you can and invite them to the wedding. And they went out, verse 10, and gathered together all that they found. So you see this invitation process never stops. There are people who turn it down, and some of those people will be held responsible. I believe there in verse uh, 7 there when he talked about rooting up their city, I believe that's a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem. The Jews didn't want it. They were invited, they didn't want it, so he went out and burned up their city, reference to the destruction of Jerusalem. But notice it's not over, it's not over. After that city, he says, you keep going out there and inviting more. You go out there, you go to the Gentiles, and you go get more. It's not over at the destruction of Jerusalem. You keep this up, you keep inviting. And, and so think about the people you can invite. I'm sure. There's a lot of similarities, I should say, in most families. And I'm sure you've got people family who are not members of the body of Christ. Invite them to come. Invite them to come to hear the gospel. I'm sure you've got people that you work with. As I say, the biggest majority of the people in the world are not Christians. And there are people you work with every day. You see them every single day at work from 8 to 5 or whatever your hours are. And you see them and you talk to them and you have relationship with them. Invite those people to come. You've got friends uh, that you associate with, some of whom I'm sure are not members of the body of Christ. Invite them to come. You've got neighbors. You wave at them, at them every day. You're going out to the car. You're going to work. And you look over and say, hey, how you doing? And, and, and you wave at them. Invite them. Invite them to come. Friends, family members, co-workers, neighbors, on and on and on. Uh, that People that you can invite. There's an endless list. You have a list that's not like mine, and I have a list that's not like yours. Everybody's list is unique, but now this is an opportunity. We're going to be meeting like four nights in a row, Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Oh, so there's plenty of opportunity there for preaching. In fact, you might even invite them over to your house or invite them out to a restaurant before services and, and, and kind of break the ice with them a little bit and, and get them relaxed to, before they come and, and just talk to them and, and kind of get them acquainted and comfortable with what's going to happen when they come. Let them know that they're not going to be singled out. Let them know uh, that nobody's going to call their, their, their personal name from the pulpit, Joe Smith or whatever your name is. They're just not going to do that. We're not going to do but but you are going to hear the gospel in its purity and its simplicity. So go out there and invite. And this is a great chance for you to do that. So that's another reason why you should attend the meeting. Here's probably one of the great reasons right here. You're going to hear some great preaching. You're going to hear some great preaching. Turn your Bibles to Acts 13. This was at the first missionary journey. 
uh, that Paul and his companions, when Paul and Barnabas went on, and there's one place in Antioch of Pisidia, in fact it's the longest record there in that first missionary journey, that whole sermon and everything that was taught there in, in Antioch and Pisidia. But in verse 42, I want you to notice this, Acts 13 and verse 42, they went into the synagogue and they got this golden opportunity. And the Jews said, listen, do you guys want to say something? Wow. It, it would be like you visiting some other congregation someplace. Perhaps a church that, that is not like ours. And, and you happen to be visiting. And, and they say, would you like to say something? Wow. What an opportunity that is. And so they stood up and they had something to say and they preached Jesus. And in verse 42, when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Do you understand the implication there? The preaching was that good. Oh, you, oh, that's good stuff. Oh, that's all, that's grace, and that's forgiveness, and that's God's love, and that's salvation, and that's heaven. And I like the sound of that. I'm burdened down with my sins, and I like the sound of salvation. I like the sound of heaven. I like the sound of forgiveness of sins. Please come back and preach again next Saturday and, and talk to us again about this. Verse 43. When the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath, just one week later, the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Wow! Can you imagine that? What would we do if the whole city of Fishers came? First of all, we wouldn't have any room, would we? We'd have to put speakers outside. But wouldn't that be a great challenge to have? We'll make it happen. We'll put speakers outside. Sit out there in a parking lot. We'll preach to you. Sit out there and listen. We'll preach to you. We'll make it happen. You see what I'm driving at here? And so you're going to hear great preaching. The man we've invited to come, Don Truex, is a seasoned gospel preacher. Very eloquent in his speech. Very knowledgeable of the scriptures. And I promise you, you will not be disappointed. He will bless you with the knowledge of Scripture. He will bless you with the knowledge of the truth. He will encourage you. If you're not a Christian, He will tell you things that you need to do to become a Christian. If you are a Christian, He will tell you things that will encourage you and strengthen your faith and make you want to serve the Lord that much more. And it will be well worth your time. And think of it. I said four days, but it's really not four whole days. It's four hours out of four days, or maybe five hours since we meet twice on Sunday. Five hours out of four whole days. You can surely spare five hours. You can surely spare five hours to hear some things that could potentially change your life. And this can change your life. This is the gospel. This is the power of God into salvation. This can change the direction your life is heading. This can take away your sins, your burden of sin. This can put you on a path, a trajectory that will wind you up in heaven before the face of God himself. That's how important this is. And that's how, how precious this message is. And I assure you, I'm confident that you will hear great preaching that week. And so that's a really good reason to come. I, I'm beginning to think that there aren't any good reasons not to come. As I look at these things, I can't think of a good reason to stay home. I can't think of a good reason to ignore this and to say no to this. And here's something else. You're going to have another opportunity to worship God. I think, that's, I think that's fantastic. Worship is not just this idea of going through these rituals. And, and please don't think that it is. We, we sometimes may leave that impression. There certainly are rituals that must be done. There are certainly things that we must do, and we're doing them this morning, things that must be done in worship. So don't, don't miss my point here, but it's much more than just going through a ritual. Worship is a way that you can express what's in your heart to God. In fact, I would argue that real worship is, is, is in here. It, it's in your heart. And, and it, it's taking what's in here and finding a way, a lawful way, a scriptural way to express that to God. And, and why are we doing that? One, we're glorifying Him for who He is. This is the creator of the universe. This is the one who spoke us into existence, who said, let there be light, and there was light who said, let us make man in our image, and he did. And so this is the one who has awesome power, who can see into the future, who can see into our hearts, who knows our deepest secrets, who knows everything about us, who knows us better than we know ourselves. He made the world, and he knows us. 
and He's done so much for us. If you're alive, God has done so much for you. First of all, that you have life. Second of all, that you have a roof over your head. Third of all, that you have food to eat. Fourth of all, and, and, and probably most important of all, He sent His Son into the world to die on a cruel cross for your sins. That, that's probably the most important aspect and the most important thing that God has ever done for you. That God Himself, because remember, Jesus is God. That God Himself put on human flesh and came in here on a mission, and that mission was to die on a cross so that you could be forgiven of your sins. These are the things that God, and you say, why worship Him? Why not worship Him? Who wouldn't want to worship the God who did all of those things for us? We express our love for God. We express our adoration for the Creator of the universe. And we're, we're able to find ways to express that in a lawful manner. Christian worship, and this is another aspect, not only is worship in here, as I was trying to say earlier, but Christian worship is, is something you should want to do. God does, if, if you come here reluctantly, stay home. God's not going to accept your worship anyway. Don't come reluctantly. God wants you to come here because you want to be here. He wants you to worship Him because you want to worship Him. And if it's done out of reluctance, if it's done out of, out of bitterness or, or resentment, you may as well not even do it because He's not going to accept it. He will reject it. He might accept the worship of the fellow right next to you, but He'll reject yours because you don't want to be here. Worship and all Christian service for that matter, anything you do for the Lord outside of worship as well, should be done because we want to do it. I want us to go through these items of worship. That's, I guess that's the best expression I can think of. These items of worship, these ways, these rituals, if you please, that we do. First of all, they're singing. And we can sing the praises of Almighty. Sing His praises. Sing of His grace. Sing of His love. And we can sing to encourage one another as well. We can pray to Him. Prayer is that, is that thing that where we just have, we have God's ear. Think of that for a moment. We've been talking about all these wonderful virtues of God and His, and his attributes. And now you, little old you and little old me, have His ear because we're His children. And He will listen to every one of us. Whatever you, and so we can bring our cares to God in prayer. We can do that right here in these assemblies. We do it at home too, but we can do it right here in these assemblies. And we can bring our cares to God and lay them at His feet. And sometimes our prayers actually change things. That's the beauty of prayer. You see, it's not just an exercise in futility. Sometimes God says, okay, I will do that for you. Sometimes He says no. Sometimes He says, wait a little while, not today, and not tomorrow, but maybe in a year. But you don't really know how He's going to respond. And so why not ask? Why not bring that out? And you have another opportunity to do that, not just on your own, but with others. And so there's prayer. And then there's teaching. You're going to receive instruction from not just any book, but the book of all books, God's book. And as you reverently listen to those words that are preached, and you think about your life, and you examine your life in view of those words, am I living up to what those words say? And if not, what changes can I make so that I might be closer to the Lord and walking closer in His will and have a better understanding of who He is? And then on Sunday, of course, like we did today, you get another chance to remember Jesus. Take the bread that represents the, the broken body of Jesus. Take the cup that represents the blood that was shed on the cross. Take those things, and as you take them, don't just eat crackers and drink grape juice, but actually think about Jesus. Actually think about what He did and what He went through, and the life that He gave up, and all the things that He did in that sacrifice. It was a sacrifice from the, from the moment He stepped out of heaven. Think of that. It wasn't just a sacrifice on a cross. That's the culmination of it. But from the moment he stepped out of heaven, it was a sacrifice. Coming down here to the earth as opposed to being in heaven. Putting on human flesh as opposed to being a spirit creature in heaven. Being subject to temptation as opposed to not being able to be touched by temptation up there in heaven. Exposed to mocking and ridicule. Exposed to challenging of your authority at every turn. Why did you say this, Jesus? Why did you say that, Jesus? I got this idea. My idea is better than yours, Jesus. And exposed to that. And then, of course, ultimately culminating in that cross. It was a sacrifice from the moment he left heaven. You see, a deep and abiding. And we get to remember that every Sunday. 
we get to remember that as we gather around the table. And we get the privilege of supporting His Word. You may not think of that as an act of worship, but it is if you're doing it right. And you think about how can I support the work of the Lord? How much can I give to support the work of the Lord? And you're giving with a sacrificial heart and a loving heart and a heart that's dedicated to the Lord and wants to see His kingdom advance. Then that giving becomes an act of worship. It's not just worship because you tossed a check in the plate or a dollar bill in the plate. It's worship because you're doing this out of a free will that you want to see His kingdom advance. And you got another chance to do that through that gospel meeting. And that should be something that every Christian wants to do. Look what I put last on the list. Most people would expect me to put that first, wouldn't they? They'd expect me to put that first, but I, I put it last on purpose. We all know what Hebrews 10.25 says. Let's go back just for good measure, though, and let's read it. Hebrews 10, and we'll start with verse 23. He says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another. Remember what I said earlier about you and the Lord and your brethren. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. A lot of people would have expected that to be the first reason, but I, I put it last because I don't think it's the most important reason. I believe we are commanded to assemble. I believe Hebrews 10.25 makes it a command. It is a command for us to be here as much as we possibly can. As much as we're humanly able to be here, we should be here. But I don't think that's the most important reason. We shouldn't serve God just out of some response to a command. We should serve God because we love Him and because we want to, you see. And so there are better reasons. In fact, there are five better reasons. These, these five reasons here are better than this. They really are. If you look at it with a sober mind, they're better than just the requirement to be here. And yet it remains that God does require it, isn't it? There's that pesky Bible again with those commandments. And yet it's full of them, isn't it? It's full of commandments from one end to the other. That's why I always get disturbed when I hear some folks disparaging the idea of commandment keeping. I'm, I'm fully aware of the fact that you can't be justified on the basis of law keeping. I'm, I'm aware of that. But don't ever disparage keeping commandments. Never do that. The Bible is full of those commandments. They weren't given in vain. They weren't given for no reason. They were given for a purpose. God expects you to do those things. And God will hold you responsible for doing those things. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 12. And verse 48, Jesus talked about rejecting His words. And among those words would be that command to assemble. In John 12 and verse 48, Jesus said, He who rejects me... And does not receive my words, has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Notice how Jesus and his words are connected. You can't separate the two. People, a lot of people want Jesus, but they don't want his words. I'll take Jesus. I'll take salvation. I'll take forgiveness of sins. But don't, don't talk to me about his commandments. Don't talk to me about his words. Jesus said they go together. You can't, you can't have me without my word. So he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. And this very word that you're saying no to, this very word that you're, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to assemble even though the Lord told me to, that very word will be there to judge you on the last day. And the Lord say, there it is, right there in your Bible, why didn't you do it? Why didn't you do that? And so if none of these other reasons click with you, maybe, just maybe, that last reason will click. Because God requires it. Now those are just a few reasons. And like I said, we could probably add to the list. We could probably make the list longer if we wanted to. And you could probably jot down a few ideas of your own about why you should be here. But the question is this. Will you? Will you? We'll find out in two weeks, won't we? Two weeks from today, the meeting starts. Brother Truex will be here. The gospel will be preached. We'll be meeting here. I'll be here. Brother Al will be here. Brother Randy will be here. Brother Jan will be here. Most of you will be here. Make sure you're among that number. Make sure you're among those who are here because it's for your benefit. It's for your good. Take out your songbooks if you're using them and turn to the song of invitation. Number 263, it will be projected, of course. What a question that is. Is your heart right with God? You think about that question, 
and, and there's, a, there's something implied in all that. We can have the externals right. When I talked about that earlier with the worship. We can have the externals right. We can have the rituals right. You can, you, you can say you believe in Jesus and you can be baptized. And you can join with a local church. You have the externals right. And you can show up every time the doors are open. But where's your heart? It's all. He doesn't just want the externals. The externals are important. The externals are important. They're required. But he doesn't just want that. He wants your heart. He wants this to be of your will and your choosing, of your own volition. So is your heart right with God? Now, I can't read your heart. God can, and you can. And I urge you to look into your heart this morning. And if your heart is not right, if things are amiss in your life, and take steps to fix that. It may be a matter between you and the Lord, and then keep it there, but deal with it. You don't need to trouble us with it, but please deal with it, because you may lose your soul if you don't. If it's a public matter, bring it before the church. We'd be happy to pray with you and encourage you every step of the way. It may be that you're not even a Christian yet, that you've not even started the journey. Your heart isn't right for sure, but you can change that today. You can put Christ on in baptism. Believe that He's the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess His name and be baptized. Behind me is the baptistry, ready to go. And the only thing missing is you. Won't you come right now while we stand and while we sing?